In today's episode, an 11-year-old boy on March break visits a family friend who also owned a lion breeding facility out of their home. In a tragic fluke event, one of the male lions escaped his enclosure located inside the home and fatally mauled him in the middle of the kitchen. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. This is the terrifying lion attack on Christian Prinsloo. Welcome to Final Affliction. Christian Prinsloo was visiting his grandmother for the two-week school holiday that began at the end of March. In South Africa, this is a busy time for most adults, since business and work goes on just as it usually would. Luckily, Christian had plenty of family and cousins that he could go visit during the holidays, but he opted to stay with his maternal grandmother instead. Mari Stridham, even though she was 75 years old, she and Christian were very close to each other, and the boy genuinely enjoyed spending time with her. But there was another reason that Christian, or Tian, like everyone called him, liked to visit his gran. Mari lived in Elisras, a town in the north of South Africa, just a stone's throw from the Botswana border. Elisras has a large farming community, with little acreages dotting the outskirts of the town for miles, and Mari was well ingrained in the community. They had nearly daily trips out to visit one friend or another, Mari usually checking in on the older members of the community if they were sick or just needed a bit of company. Tian spent those drives absorbing all of the books that the town's library had to offer, while he eagerly awaited the next stop and the next adventure. Most of those plots and farms had at least half a dozen interesting animals on it, and the residents never had a shortage of cookies and treats for the polite young man, who was always willing to lend a helping hand where he could. One acreage took in abandoned gazelle calves, another had cages full of rabbits and guinea pigs, and yet another had a troop of meerkats that liked to sneak into the farm owner's house to wreak havoc. It was every 11-year-old's dream holiday, but none was more interesting than the plot they were visiting on that April in 2017. This couple kept real-life lions. It might sound extreme to us, but there are quite a few such places in South Africa. Usually, people raise abandoned cubs by hand, either to extend breeding programs, to reintroduce them into areas where inbreeding or poaching has affected the big cat populations, or just to sell off to private collectors in zoos around the world. It's a dangerous profession, but one that's taken very seriously, and always with the magnificent animal's future at the forefront. On this little patch of land, there were three fully grown lions, all hand-raised and about as close to tame as a wild cat could come. Tian had even played with a few cubs that found their way there before they were taken to their new homes, but these three had been on the property so long that it was by now their permanent home. Each had its own spacious cage, and every morning at late afternoon they were given free reign of the fenced-in four acres to stretch their legs, roll in the ground, and sharpen their nails on the massive mulberry trees all over the property. Their owners never allowed visitors to come over during the lion's free time, and only the husband and wife ever fed them. But by the time Tian and his gran arrived, they'd already been out for their walk and had been fed and returned to their holdings, so there was no danger to either of them being on the property at that time. Or at least, that's what they thought. Mari and Tian spent a few minutes chatting with the owner's wife, whose husband was out of town. Mari had known the couple for years, and so did Tian. This was just a social call to catch up over a cup of tea and to make sure that all was well with the woman who was alone so far out of town. While Mari busied herself in the kitchen with making tea for all of them, the wife stepped away to attend to an errand at the back of the house, leaving Mari and Tian in the kitchen. Tian, returning the milk to the fridge, didn't see the adult African lion poke his nose into the open kitchen door. Apparently, someone had not closed its heavy metal gate properly, and predictably, it used its newfound freedom to come to investigate Mari and Tian's unfamiliar sense. Mari saw it immediately, and as soon as her eyes fell on the creature, she moved in between her grandson and the beast in one swift motion. Tian heard her call out to him softly, and to his horror, he saw what was standing right in the kitchen door. 
Tian was not some uninformed child. He knew full well that no matter how much a lion's been in contact with humans, it's never truly tame. The ice-cold fear that coursed through him was nearly enough to fossilize him where he stood. But his grandmother, calm and without taking her eyes off the cat, told him to get out of the kitchen and into the safety of the house. Tian did as he was told, but he wasn't as calm as Mari. Tian spun around and began to run. The moment he did, he became just another gazelle fleeing from a hunter, just like any other prey running for their lives. And even though the lion was well-fed and not at all hungry, all of its natural instincts kicked into gear. In that instant, it sprang into action, knocking Mari to the ground, and with two strides it leapt through the air, landing on Tian's back before the boy even made it halfway across the kitchen. Its nails wrapped around his tiny shoulders, and its teeth sank into the back of Tian's neck and upper back. This male was on the younger side, its mane just having grown in fully, and it had never hunted before in its entire life. Had this been an experienced hunter, that bite would have been well aimed and it wouldn't have missed the jugular. Its full weight and the speed with which it had come at the 11-year-old slammed him to the ground with such force that two of his ribs and his nose broke instantly. Mari moved faster than a woman her age was supposed to. One moment the beast and the boy were on the ground, and the next, Mari was on top of them. She grabbed the mane, pulling as hard as she could. The cat let go of Tian, gave an angry swipe in her direction, and turned back to its prey. Mari didn't even feel the nails raking over her forearm and shoulder. She just launched herself back at the cat, completely disregarding its growls and teeth. On its back, she yanked and pulled, screaming in primal maternal anger. The noise had alerted the homeowner, and the woman came bursting into the kitchen just as Mari launched her second attempt to pull the animal off her grandson. The woman's yells were familiar enough to pull the lion out of its natural prey drive. It pulled out its nails from the boy's back and began to backtrack toward the open door, throwing Mari off its back in the process. Mari didn't wait for the tiles to get warm beneath her. Slipping on her and her grandson's blood, she scrambled to Tian's unmoving body. The homeowner ran after the lion, got it back in its cage, and ran back to the house with the intention of calling an ambulance. But Mari was one step ahead of her. She'd grabbed the car keys off the counter, threw them at her friend, and picked up Tian like he weighed nothing. The adrenaline was fueling her now. Even at 75, with her own wounds and her age dragging her down, she suddenly could have been 20 years old again. It took them 20 minutes to reach the nearest hospital, and there the damage was starkly clear. The back of Tian's neck and his back were shredded beyond repair. He was completely unresponsive, and his breathing was shallow. Besides patching up the deepest scratches to slow the bleeding and to get him on a transfusion, all that the small-town hospital could do was wait for the helicopter to arrive to airlift Tian to Pretoria City, where the best surgeons and specialists were already waiting. Mari, on the other hand, refused all treatment, insisting to stay with her grandson. It wasn't until the aircraft disappeared into the horizon that she finally collapsed from exhaustion and grief that staff were able to stitch her up. Her wounds were deep, but not fatal, and she was released within a few days. Tian was whisked into surgery the moment he arrived, but his condition was too dire. Unless a miracle happened, there was no waking up from the intense damage that his spinal cord received. The connection between the brain and the rest of the body was severed when those teeth gripped down his spine. For three weeks, Tian remained in his comatose state. He was kept breathing by the machines that beeped away in the background. His parents, Herman and Adri Prinsloo, kept vigil at his bedside, begging the public for prayers, while their only child showed no signs of brain activity. Three weeks of hell later, and Tian died just one day after his twelfth birthday. Mari made a full recovery, but she never stopped reliving the trauma of that day. And as for the lion, in a rare twist of events, the Prinsloo family did not wish for it to be put down. They recognized that it was only acting on instinct, driven by forces beyond its control. It was rehomed to another facility or park that's never been disclosed. They did not wish to pursue legal action. They realized that it was a mistake, and whether or not it was negligence or fate, a battle in the courts would never return their sweet, animal-loving boy back from his terrifying 
final affliction. 